I have preached there for quite some while because they have allowed me to do so. They're very patient people. I'm very sympathetic. I'm not sure, but they've put up for me with me for quite a while, and I am certainly grateful and count the tremendous privilege to be a part of the Pennsburg congregation. But I'm also extremely privileged to have an association with this good church, and I appreciate so much the good work that's done here. And among that work, and a part of that work, is the West Virginia School of Preaching. And I, as those who have gone before me, would be amiss if I did not express appreciation to Denver and to this lectureship committee and to the elders that oversee all of this work and all of the members that make up this church for the work that's being done and for the invitation that has been extended to me and the privilege of being a part of this program. I don't, I'm not going to say a whole lot about um, <clears throat> my appreciation. I hope that you know that uh, from my heart at this point. But I would like to take a moment to make some comments concerning the lectureship book. It has been noted previously that this is the fourth uh, of the lectureships that have dealt with the minor prophets, and with this volume and with this lectureship, the minor prophets have been covered. And I would like to say that uh, I uh, believe that those four volumes are extremely valuable and really deserve a place in every library that can find the possibility of putting them there. And I would say, even along with that, that I believe that this year's volume is, at least at what I can see at this point, maybe the best of all of them. And I've been very impressed with it. A lot of really hard work has gone into it. Of course, those that have contributed the material for the book uh, labored but you know, that's just the beginning, and there are those that have labored over uh, some of the poor things that I, you know, have written and, and, and had to clean them up quite a bit, and, and, and to take all of that and put it in this fine volume so that we not only can have the privilege of being at this lectureship, but this will live on for hopefully years and years and maybe generations to come that will be a positive contribution to the Lord's work and the kingdom upon this earth. So I recommend it highly to you. If you haven't secured a copy of that yet, uh, this is a free commercial, uh, Denver. He didn't put me up to this. I really genuinely recommend that to you. I said earlier uh, up at the dining hall that uh, people needed to look out because I was expecting a mass exodus as soon as that fine meal had been drawn to a conclusion. But I must say, I was wrong about that. And I am extremely impressed with the good number of people that are here on a Thursday afternoon in uh, you know what is kind of a long week for those who have been here through the duration. And uh, you know, the bottom can only, or the mind can only stand what the bottom can endure. And after a while, no matter how good it is, the bottom you know, takes its toll. But you have been troopers, and uh, many of you have been here, I think, for every lecture, and that is just so commendable, and I uh, want, to, want you to know that that has not gone uh, unnoticed. And so we appreciate the fact that you are here, and there are folks here from far and wide, and we appreciate the interest. It is so encouraging to the, the brethren here and to the School of Preaching and those who are involved in it to know that there are so many people that are so interested in the work that is going on and the contribution that you are making that enables that to happen. And so our appreciation goes to you. You know, the people of Israel were a truly blessed people. The people of Israel were a people that God had taken and had made them his chosen people. He loved them. He made a great nation of them. 
He gave them a land that was flowing with milk and honey. He provided for them. He protected them. Whatever need that they had, he was the answer and he was the solution to whatever need and to whatever problem that they had. Yet, the history of Israel is one that is marred by repeated rebellion against God. Not only is it repeated rebellion against God, but it is also repeated repudiation of his holy law. God had raised up prophet after prophet and sent them to condemn the sinfulness and the wickedness of Israel and to call upon them to repent and to return to him. In the days of Jeremiah, we find that God spoke. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 25 to 28, we see that he says, Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they did not obey me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, and they did worse than their fathers. Therefore, I shall speak all these words to them, but... They will not obey. So we see that God made it abundantly clear that the fact that Israel was not living the way that they ought to live was not any doings of his. That God had done all that he could to pave the way for Israel. He had done all that he could to be long-suffering to them and he sent them prophet after prophet to help correct the error of their ways. And so he had done everything possible to keep them a faithful people. Following their exodus from Egypt, Moses was called upon to go up on the mount, up on Mount Sinai, to receive the law that God would give. They were given the responsibility to know that law. They were given the responsibility to remember that law. And they were given the responsibility to pass that law on to their posterity. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, we find these words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates you see God wanted them not only to have the law but he wanted them to know the law But furthermore, he not only wanted them to know the law, but he wanted them to have the law always before their eyes. That they would walk in the precepts that he had given. Faithfulness to God is not possible where forgetfulness of his law exists. Now I want you to think about that. Faithfulness to God is not possible where there is forgetfulness of his law. These people that go around talking about this idea that they don't need the church and they really don't need the Bible and that they've got this thing going with God and they're really close with him and they have this special bond, that's all hogwash. They're deceiving themselves. You cannot be what God wants you to be and reject and neglect the holy writ which he has given. It just simply does not work that way. In Hosea chapter 4 and in verse 6, God chastised Israel by saying, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. In the closing words of the Old Testament scriptures, we see that a final plea is made to God's people that they might remember His law. When God gave the law, He told them to remember it. 
When we find the Old Testament coming to a close, he again is exhorting them and warning them that they might remember his law. Malachi chapter 4 and in verse 4, the text that has been assigned for our consideration this afternoon is one that once again reminds Israel of God's expectation for them in this regard. And there he said, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I have commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Well, this plea was issued during a time when God was sorely displeased with the sinful service of his people. He was not pleased with the way they were living. He was not pleased with their lack of faithfulness to him. And so we see that he once again calls upon them and provides for them the remedy of the ills that they had. All of the things that were problematic for them, God gives them the prescription. And that is, go back to my word. Remember what I have spoken. You know, that's the problem with the change agents of our day. They keep looking to the future for solutions and how they're going to improve upon the church and how they're going to improve upon God's plan and how they're going to change this and improve that. And it just doesn't work that way. From the very beginning, we know that the real answer to that is not by looking for something new. It's going back to that which was originally given. You can't improve upon that which God has given. And the day that we move away from the Bible is the day that we draw the ire of God. And so God calls his people to return to him. Malachi had earlier addressed Four areas where Israel were in flagrant disobedience to God. The fact that God is calling on them to remember his law is in a context where Malachi has already established very clearly that Israel was in disobedience to him. And there are four major areas of disobedience that had drawn the notice of God that he mentions in this book. Number one, we notice that Israel had despised the name of God in chapter 1 and verse 6. Secondly, he chastised them because they had defiled the worship of God, chapter 1, verse 7. Number three, Israel had departed from the law of God, chapter 2 and verse 8. And then number four, they had dealt treacherously with the covenant of God, chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. In spite of this, God pleads with them one more time to remember the law of Moses, my servant. Clinton Gill stated it this way. He said it would be some 400 years before Jehovah would speak again. In the interim, if they are to survive as his people, the law must be remembered. You know, I think that's a sobering thought. When you consider that he writes here and he chastises them for despising the name of God, and we've just heard a wonderful Wonderful treatment of that topic in the previous hour. How that they had despised the name of God. And all of the problems that they had. And God says to them, you need to remember my law. And with that, he is found in silence for the next 400 years. With the only remedy they had were those words that hopefully rang, remember my law. Those are not just words that they needed to hear. Those are words that every generation that's ever lived and ever will live upon this earth need to hear and remember and heed. Remember God's law. As it was imperative that Israel remembered the law of Moses, it's equally vital that folks today 
will remember the law of Christ, that will heed what the Lord says to us. Not only is it important to remember God's law, but there are several characteristics of God's law that are important for us to notice and to remember. There are several different ways that we could approach this assignment today. And I wrestled with which approach I might take, and I settled on this one. Believing that we probably have a gathering of people here that are students of the Word of God, and for the most part, we understand the importance of hearing, uh, of adhering to God's law. I thought that we might take a look at the law of God in general today. And notice that there are several characteristics of it that fortify our faith, And a proper understanding of will buttress us up in our faith in God's law that will help us hopefully to be faithful to him. And so today, as we think about this idea of remembering God's law, let me suggest to you, number one, that it is important that we remember the inspiration of God's law. When we think about the law of God, when we think about the Holy Scriptures, when we think about this book that you hold in your hand, we think about that which is given by the inspiration of God. The word inspiration is found only once in the New Testament, in 2 Timothy 3, and in verse 16, the Bible says that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. When giving consideration to the subject of inspiration, attention must be given to three things in particular. When we talk about the inspiration of God, it's important for us to begin by thinking about this idea of origin. What makes the Bible the Bible? Why is it that we call the Bible the Word of God and the Law of God and all of those things? It has to do with the origin. It has to do with the fact that this book is not like any other book that you've ever seen, that you've ever read, that you've ever possessed. There is one book like this and one alone. It is the Bible and it is different from every other book because it's the one that God gave and all the others have been produced by man. You know, the phrase that we find here given by inspiration It is one that's translated from the Greek word theonoustos. Gene, Steve's not here, I don't think. If I mispronounce that, I guess that's the theme of the day here. You're the the pronunciation guy. But something to that order. Okay, thank you. That literally means God breathed. We talk about that and we should. It literally means God breathed. That's why this book is different from every other book. It's because it's from God. It has to do with the origin of these words. This is not a book that was produced by man. It is not one that was written by man. It is one that came from heaven. This does not simply mean that it is from God. It means that it literally is the word of God. It means that the Bible is not of human origin. It's from God. Peter put it this way in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, when he said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. How many of you, you don't need to show uh, hands here, but how many of you have ever been talking to someone about the Bible And you'll show them a passage of scripture, and because they don't like what that passage says, they'll say, well, the Bible says that it is of no private interpretation, and we're not, that's just your interpretation of the Bible. Well, if that's not a butchering of that idea and this passage, I just simply do not know what it is. The idea here of it not being of any private interpretation has to do with origin. It's where it came from. And he defines it as such in that last statement there. He said prophecy never came by the will of man. You see, it has to do with origin. It didn't come from man. Well, where did it come from? It came from God. It is God's holy book. It is, ho- it is God's holy law. And the apostle is stating that no scripture is of any private origin and that it did not originate with men, 
but with God. I teach 1 Peter through Jude. And somewhere on a test, somewhere throughout that quarter, there's going to be a question that my students have to explain this verse. And if there's not the word origin somewhere in that answer, they do not pass that class until they get that. We cannot effectively preach this book if we do not have a proper understanding of the origin thereof. In the next place, not only does this have to do with origin, it has to do with agency. God gave his word, and he did so through human agency, and they were called prophets. He delivered it through prophets. The book of Hebrews opens with these words, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the prophets. But these last days has spoken to us by his son. You see, there are agents involved in the delivering of God's word. From heaven to earth. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 21, Peter adds that for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is involved in the conveyance of God's word to man's possession. So all scripture is of divine origin and came to us through human agency as prophets were guided by the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah the prophet clarified it immensely when he said in one of my favorite verses in uh, regard to inspiration in Jeremiah 1 and verse 9 when he said the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and the Lord said to me behold I have put my words in your mouth. You see it's God breathed. These are not the words of men. This is not a book produced by men. This literally is the word of God. In the third place, when we talk about the inspiration of God's law, we must say something about the authority of that law. Since all scripture is from God, then it is final authority. All of Israel's wrongs could have been corrected if only they would have remembered the law that God had given them through Moses. It's immensely important to note that hundreds of years had passed since Moses had received that law. And yet, let us notice this, it had not changed. Something else had not changed. They were still amenable to it. God had not changed his law. It was still the same law, it was still in effect, and their responsibility to it was the same as it ever had been. Many today fail to honor the authority of the Bible. The way that the Bible is neglected and abused and thrown around and butchered and all kinds of other things that we could say it would be hard to distinguish it between the morning newspaper that's wrapped up in the scraps from the table and the coffee grounds and thrown into the garbage. We must recognize the authority of the Bible as the law of God. And the way that many treat the Bible and fail to recognize the authority of it is evidenced by immoral lifestyles, by hypocritical living of weak Christians, and by the innovative worship practices that we see going on in churches throughout the land. But Jesus said, the scripture cannot be broken. The Bible is the final authority. It's the authority for all that we do this day. It's the authority for our lives. It is that which will guide our life all the way throughout to the end and on into eternity. And in the last day when we stand before the judgment bar of God, the Bible says that the books will be opened and we're going to be judged by the things that God wrote in this book. 
we must recognize. We talk about the authority of the Word of God. We must think about its authority. In the second place, when we think about this idea of remembering God's law, we need to remember the inerrancy of God's law. The book that you hold in your hand is free from errors. As they found out, you know, the things that I write, it contains errors. It may be as little a thing as maybe a punctuation here and there. But, you know, there's a possibility that I could write something that would just simply be false or contradictory in nature. But, you see, that's what sets apart the Word of God, the Bible, from the writings of men. Because the Bible is inerrant. It is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. And to believe in the inspiration of God's law leads one to remember the inerrancy of that law. That is, to believe that the Bible is without error and that it is, in its entirety, truth. In Titus chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul claimed to be in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now the apostle claimed to be preaching the word that he had received directly from God. Given the fact that it is impossible for God to lie, then that word is absolutely true. Brother Allen Hires, on one occasion, wrote these words. He said, we believe the scriptures are without error because they were given by God. And God cannot lie, Titus 1, verse 2. The scriptures take on the nature of the one who gave them. How could a perfect God convey his message to us in an imperfect way? If we believe the scriptures contained error, how could we say that they are infallible in faith and doctrine? You know, Jesus said in John 8 and verse 32... Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How could we ever have confidence in what Jesus said there and at the same time have doubts about what we have in the Bible? Jesus made us a promise. He said, you shall know the truth. And yet there are those that say, well, you know, truth is relative. What's truth for you may not necessarily be truth for me. How can we ever know the truth? Well, to do that is to impugn our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because he said that that which we have is truth and we can know the truth. You know, in the 19th Psalm, there in verses 7 through 9, we find some really interesting words from David in regard to the law of God. And the nature of it. You know, Brother Pugh, a little while ago, referred to uh, Psalm 19 and verse 6, which says, concerning the sun, its rising is from one end of the heaven and circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. But I want you to notice that just on the heels of that, he moves on to these observations concerning the law of God. And notice what he says here. He says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, and the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Look at what David had to say here. He says concerning the law of the Lord that it is perfect, it is sure, it is right, it is pure, it is true, it is righteous. You know one thing we don't find David saying is, you know I wonder what God says. I wonder if I can really believe what God says. I wonder if the Bible could be any help to me. You can't miss the great regard that David had for the law of God. 
moving from the 19th Psalm to the 119th Psalm. And those 176 verses, and they, you can count on one hand the verses that do not contain high accolades and exaltation for the law of God. And you're not sure whether or not you can find time today to read a chapter from the Bible. When we think about all of this, we consider what David had to say, surely we cannot miss the fact that David wanted us to remember the inerrancy of the law of God. In the third place, in order for us to remember God's law, it's important for us to remember the indestructibility of God's law. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That which the Lord spoke is his eternal word. And a word fitly spoken on every occasion. It's difficult for men to comprehend something as being indestructible. It's difficult for us to comprehend something that is going to last forever. You know, it is the case that clothes rot and cars rust and buildings collapse and empires fall. It is hard for us to comprehend anything that is going to last forever, that's going to endure. We search all of creation and we can point to nothing that lasts forever. However, the word of God is everlasting and it is indestructible. Again, Peter said, all flesh is a grass and all the glory of man is the flower of grass, but the grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord, it endures forever. We notice that regardless of these inspired declarations, men continue to launch assaults upon the Bible in futile efforts to try and to destroy it. It's not anything new. It's something that has been going on, going on for century after century. For example, we were reminded of Jehoiakim in Jeremiah 36 that attempted to destroy the word of God by taking a knife and cutting it into pieces and throwing it into the fire. You're familiar with the skeptic Voltaire that said within 50 years the Bible would perish. But you know what? Voltaire has perished, but the Bible prevails. In the early 1900s, Robert Ingersoll said in regard to the Bible in a lecture, he said, and I quote, in 15 years I will have this book in the morgue. And within 15 years, Ingersoll was in the morgue. And the Bible lives on. A.Z. A. Z. Conrad poetically spoke of the Bible's indestructibility when he said century follows century, and there it stands. Empires rise and fall and forgotten, there it stands. Atheists rail against it, there it stands. Agnostics smile cynically, there it stands. Profane, prayerless punsters caricature it. There it stands. Belief abandons it. There it stands. Higher critics deny its claims. There it stands. The flames of persecution are kindled against it. There it stands. The tooth of time gnaws but makes not a dent in it. There it stands. Infidels predict its abandonment. There it stands. Modernists try to explain it away. And there it stands. When we talk about the word of God, we're talking about that which is inspired. We're talking about that which is inerrant. And we're talking about that which is indestructible. In the fourth place, we think about remembering God's law. Let us remember the indisputable accuracy of that law. Many have 
fallen victim to the temptation to discredit the Bible because of some seeming inaccuracy. But they do that only to find later that that which is inaccurate was themselves. Many have made great claims of finding flaws and errors, and inconsistencies and contradictions in the Bible. But that is just a reflection of one's own ignorance and not flaws in God's law. The scriptures have never been proven to be false in any claim that it makes. There are several areas in which the Bible proves itself to be incredibly accurate and I have listed several things in the book for you to consider but very briefly we'll make mention of three things. When we think about the fact that the Bible is indisputably accurate in all of its claims we're reminded of its accuracy historically. It is accurate in all of the things that it has to say in matters of history. And the Bible contains a great deal of history. Human history books are constantly being revised. They're constantly being updated. And if you don't believe that, if you've got children, you have to keep buying new books, don't you? They keep replacing those old history books. One of the reasons is more history is contained in them, but another reason is they have to correct all the flaws. But you know, when it comes to the Bible, that's not necessary. For the thousands of years that Holy Writ has been in existence, never has there ever been a need for a correction, for a reprint to hide some embarrassing error that may exist there. In the second place, let us notice that the Bible is geographically accurate. Although many of the geographical references in the Bible have been thought to be untrue, none of them have been proven to be such. As a matter of fact, there have been many of those that, you know, uh, folks thought were really wrong and, and, and inconsistent and that they were errors for only to find out that history and and archaeology and things of that nature ultimately prove the Bible to be true. In the third place, let us notice that the Bible is scientifically accurate. Uh, accurate. It's by the fact that many folks have thought that the Bible is contain, it contained many scientific inconsistencies and inaccuracies. There are even so-called religious people that have made bold statements about the Bible and how that we should never expect the Bible to be a scientifically accurate book. And they'll make claims like, well, the Bible writers did not know of the modern day scientific advances and we should not expect them to be able to write in a scientifically accurate way. That says a whole lot about their view of the inspiration of the Bible. Because Malachi, and Matthew, and Paul, and Moses did not need to rely upon themselves, upon their own knowledge, upon their own intelligence, upon their own education, but what they spoke by inspiration. The God of heaven, who created heaven and earth and all things therein, should be able to write a book about what he created and do so accurately. In the next place, as we hurry on, as we remember God's law, let us remember the immutability of that law. I've heard that word used a couple of times already today, and it just simply means it's not changeable. That means that God has given us his word. His word stands forever. and He has warned us strictly that we're not to try to change it in any way. It's imperative that one remember that the Word of God never changes. God's Word is eternal. It's not subject to change. The psalmist said, Forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse 89. Concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. Psalm 119, verse 152. The psalmist had a clear understanding of the immutability of the law of God. 
One of the great mistakes of the human race is to fail to recognize that God's word does not change. In Jude 3, Jude says, Beloved, when I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once, the New King James says, once for all delivered unto the saints. There will be no further revelation. There will be no future revelation. There will be no modern day revelation. It is that which was once for all delivered to the saints. And that which is contained in the Bible is God's complete revelation, which he has delivered to guide man for as long as the world stands. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. We need to remember God's law. When we remember the law of God, we'll remember the inspiration of God's law. We must remember the inerrancy of God's law, the indestructibility of God's law, the indisputable accuracy of God's law, and the immutability of God's law. You know, God knew that we we're forgetful creatures. When giving them the Passover, he did so so that they would not forget what God had done for them down in Egypt. The night prior to our Lord's death, he met in that upper room to observe that Passover feast. And he changed that meal on that night when he took that unleavened bread and that fruit of the vine. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. He knew we were forgetful creatures. Israel of old had forgotten the law of God. And Israel today will forget God's law as well. If we're not constantly called back to that law, to remember it, to keep it in our heart that we might not sin against God and that we might become what he would have us to be and one day being found before him holy and blameless and hearing those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord.